ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. They'll be saying, they'll continue to say, who writes your scripts? I do. That is 21-year-old Jude Bellingham after he authored a thrilling escape at the Euros. For him, for his teammates, for his manager, for England. As he peeled away in celebration from a pivotal goal, you could see him screaming, who else? Well, actually, the skipper, Harry Kane, finished the job and sent England to the quarterfinals. Is this golden moment one for the fools or the true believers? I'm Patrick Stack. This is ABC Sport Daily. Daniel Garb is a football reporter. He's covered World Cups, Champions League finals. You name it, Garby. The arc of today's conversation is a doom, joy, doom, question mark arc. We're going to set the scene as to why this England team arrived at a clash with Slovakia so intensely disliked by their own fans, seemingly. Can you sort of spell it out for us? Well, so much of it is just frustration and expectation and the drought for a major trophy that dates back to 1966 and the talent that's at their disposal and this constant desire from English football fans for this team to deliver and click. And they have underwhelmed this tournament. There's no doubt about that. And in the lead up to it. So it was bubbling away coming into the Euros that all this talent was failing to gel and that England fans had seen it so many times before. If you look back to Sven Goran Eriksson's teams in the mid 2000s, and that has really frustrated the supporter, um, along with the manager, Gareth Southgate, who's been there for a while now gone very close before, but seems to have regressed a little bit with the team and their confidence and the tactics get pulled apart and the selections get pulled apart and everything we've seen from arguably the greatest underachievers in world sport, the England men's national football team, they're coming to the fore once more. Um, But they got past Slovakia this morning and who knows, maybe it'll be a story that's a flips on its head a little bit and maybe England will get get to the final and have a chance of winning it. Maybe this will be similar to Italia 90 when they eke their way through the early stages of the tournament and then the nation all got behind them and there was this fairy tale run to the semi-finals. It could end up like that. For about 90 minutes, there wasn't much to suggest that there would be a happy ending against Slovakia. I mean, Jude Bellingham has been in some ways emblematic of the struggles, you know, prodigiously talented, but only seen glimpses of it. How did he turn everything around. Well, that's what he does. He bobs up with important goals. Slovakia so close to a famous win. And England get the equaliser. Jude Bellingham's done it. And that is why Gareth Southgate wants to play him in that position as the number 10. And to be honest, that was probably a mini win for Gareth Southgate because so much talk has been, you know, do you drop Bellingham back a little bit deeper, play someone else in that position? balance out the midfield a little bit more. He has remained steadfast in his belief that Bellingham needs to operate behind Harry Kane because he is as big a threat on goal, if not more than anyone in that England team. And he proved that. It was a wonderful finish from a hugely talented player who came into the tournament with a lot of confidence. He had a fantastic campaign for Real Madrid. I think there's a fair argument that the Ballon d'Or is probably a three-way race between Drew Bellingham, Kylian Mbappe, and perhaps Vinicius Jr. from Brazil. And he's at that level best-in-the-world kind of standard, potentially. It was just a fantastic finish, but there have been moments in the group stages where he's been a little bit anonymous and he hasn't been threatening enough. But something like that might just get him going, might get the confidence going. A, a superb finish and, and one at such a crucial time. And uh, One of the, the best in our country's history, I reckon. Maybe they'll look back, England, at that moment as the goal that t- turned their tournament around. You touched on the fact that Harry Kane was able to essentially put England into the next round with a vital goal. Did that win overall save Gareth Southgate's job? Uh, Yeah, potentially. Look, I don't think they would have made many decisions the next day or anything like that, but I I don't think Gareth Southgate will stay on for the next World Cup regardless. I think it's it's more likely than not they'll make a change unless they go and win the Euros um, or make the final. That might flip it on its head. There's no doubt if they'd lost to Slovakia that Gareth Southgate would have been gone. I mean, simply the the tidal wave of negativity around him would become overbearing. And he's copped a lot. And some of it is unfair. 
people have short memories in sport these days. We know that. This is a team that hadn't made a final of a major tournament since winning the World Cup in 1966. Gareth Southgate lost the last Euros in a penalty shootout to Italy. Saka has to score. It's saved by Donnarumma. And it's Italy who are the champions of Europe. Made the semi-finals of the World Cup in 2018. He has transformed their culture from a team that was prodigiously talented in the mid-2000s and early 2010s. But openly, players have said this, did not like playing together, did not enjoy going into camp. He has played a massive role in transforming their culture. There, there was a spirit and, uh, you know, there was a togetherness that has been building. And he deserves a lot of credit for that because they actually enjoy playing together now and they are one as a team. Look at who came on there. They're, they're, we've won this game together. Uh, not me, not Harry, not the individual moments where, you know, you look back on it in maybe a few years' time and talk about the game. And they're just not clicking so far at these Euros. Um, but I think a lot of English fans have forgotten what Southgate has managed to transform culturally in that team. And, and I think that has been regrettable. No doubt if they lose this game, he's gone. Um, and look, I'd, I'd say it's very hard for him to stay on going into the, the next World Cup in North America and Mexico. But if they win this tournament and make the final, maybe, just maybe, he'll, um, he'll be there for a few more years. You talk about a tidal wave of criticism. It's a beautiful way of breaking it down. And Bellingham was pointed about the criticism he and the team have received after this victory. Playing for England is an enjoyable feeling, but it's also a lot of pressure. You hear people talk a lot of rubbish. And, you know, it's nice that when you deliver, um, you can give them a little bit back. You know, it's, it's very difficult in press conferences and interviews and things like that to... Um, to talk as openly as, as footballers want to because they're always judged. And um, for me, football and being on the pitch, scoring goals, celebrating is my release. And, you know, it's maybe a message to a few people, but uh, it was a very happy moment and full of adrenaline. I found the way that he, Kane, Southgate have been very open about the toll that that has taken to be very interesting, don't you think, Garby? I think so. I think in the past, English teams and, and players have tried to act as if it doesn't bother them have tried to to shield away from it, if you like. I don't know if it's a positive or not. I, I don't know if it's a psychological lesson from their mentors in that department or not, but maybe it is better for them to come out and actually speak about it and say, you know what, it is actually affecting us. You know, the media are there to report. They're not there to support. So I don't necessarily think you can criticize them. The fans can do whatever they please. They pay their money. They pay lots of money to travel and support the team and they want to see better performances. That's understandable from all. But as we've always seen with England, it goes over the top. It becomes almost a, a bullying episode from the fans. And it just mounts and piles on and just becomes out of control. And I think that starts to get to the players and frustrates them. It doesn't help them. Um, there's no doubt about that. They play within themselves. They are cautious. And they're a little bit inhibited and with their runs and their passing because you know, they're worried about making mistakes because of everything that is said afterwards if that happens. I think it's actually been a positive that players have, have spoken out against it and maybe it helps them mentally to deal with it all by by doing that. And we'll see from here. Who knows? Maybe they'll, they'll transform like they did in Italia 90, as I said before, transform the, uh, the public sentiment against them to uh, that wave of support. If they're to transform... It feels as though Bellingham's going to be the talisman. It's one thing to score that stunning equaliser. Bellingham scored England's first goal of the tournament against Serbia into the very same net. And just as they were about to slide out of the competition, he keeps their hopes alive. I thought it was another thing to hear him speak with such maturity in the wake of the outcome. Very happy, you know, it's been tough the last week or so. Um, to try and keep the negative energy outside of the camp. And I think um, today they'll have been ready for us. I'm sure you've got a few questions scribbled out on that piece of paper there. That package is rare, the maturity and the on-field skill. What's the ceiling for Jude Bellingham? Yeah, he's a special sporting talent, not just because of what he can do on the field, but yes, the way in which he conducts himself. He's, he's still so young. He was 21 yesterday and... Um... You know, he's he's doing unbelievably well. Yes, he seems far more experienced than that. I mean, he's well-travelled. You know, he, he went to Germany early on in his career rather than coming through in England. He's now playing at Real Madrid. You know, he's definitely far more worldly than many a young English talent to come before him. 
And I think that shows on the football field. He is the main man, but there are others. I mean, Harry Kane delivers that big goal. Maybe that gets him going. Met by Dubravka, sent goalwards again, headed across. Kane's there, 2-1 England! Oh, what a turnaround here in Gelsenkirchen! We still can see the best of Phil Foden at this tournament. Declan Rice has had moments. He's come close. He hits the post this morning. I mean, he's a, a world-class central midfielder. Although Mainu had a, a really good game. I think Trent Alexander-Arnold could come back into the picture for the next game and give them something from right back. There are other players there that can also pull those levers. And that is exciting for England. But Bellingham will be happy to take the responsibility on his own shoulders. The ceiling for him, I mean, how much better can you get than what he's been able to do with, with Real Madrid this season? Winning the Champions League, scoring the amount of goals that he did. Now we'll see if he can cap it off with um, you know, a big run in the Euros. But as I said before, he's, he's a Ballon d'Or candidate. He's a best player in the world type of, of athlete. That is how good he is. And, and he's still got so many years left in him um, and, and a peak to reach still, which is uh, hugely exciting. The soap opera sees England next taking on Switzerland. Cannot wait to see how this one all plays out in the quarterfinals of the Euros. Daniel Garb, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, mate. Headlines. Wimbledon gets underway Monday night and there are 14, count them, 14 Australians in the main draw across men's and women's at the All England Club. I'm interested to see how Alex Bolt goes against Casper Ruud on day one. Bolt had to navigate a wild tightrope just to make the main draw. Now he gets the eighth seed as a gift. Daria Saville is also in action. You can catch it all on the ABC Listen app. Golf and Aussie Cam Davis has claimed his second PGA Tour victory winning in Detroit. He was emotional after scoring a one-shot win. Yeah, from where I was a couple of weeks ago to today, just a completely different person. This is <laughs> a little emotional, actually. Yeah, I wouldn't wish what happened to Akshay on anyone, but oh, I've done a lot of grinding to kind of get myself out of a hole and to just all of a sudden do that. <sighs> That's pretty good. <laughs> Davis revealed he's been working with a hypnotherapist, which has had huge benefits for his game. Oscar Piastri has finished second at the Austrian Grand Prix. It's the fourth podium of his career. His teammate Lando Norris crashed with Max Verstappen. Norris failed to finish. The Red Bull driver came in fifth. George Russell claimed the victory. An enormous weekend for Australian rugby with Michael Hooper announcing he won't make the Paris Olympics and he's retiring from Aussie footy immediately. Meanwhile, Kirtley Beale suffered a possible Achilles injury while playing for Ramwick, raising questions about his future just days after earning Wallabies' selection. And India cricket fans are still celebrating after they knocked over South Africa to win the T20 World Cup in the West Indies as they broke a long ICC tournament drought. I'm Patrick Stack. This is ABC Sport Daily, produced by Poppy Penny. Thanks to Optus Sport, MM Football and the PGA Tour for the extra audio used in this episode. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.